Hey everybody, this is my thoughts on the four expansion packs or DLCs, depending on which ones you're talking about, for Destiny. These are The Dark Below, The House of Wolves, The Taken King, and Rise of Iron. You may be wondering why I would do this, considering that my review of the original Destiny was on the Xbox 360 and that didn't have access to all of the expansions. Well, after I picked up my PS4, I had very few games for it and one of the ones I ended up picking up later on down the line was Destiny Complete. It was on sale. And my main justification for picking that up was actually the fact that I knew I was going to be covering Destiny 2 at some point, and I figured that I needed to at least touch on the expansion packs before I go ahead and do Destiny 2. I actually originally planned this to be a full review of the expansion packs, but the more I played them, the more I realized that an MTO would be all I could really manage for them. And the reasons for that will actually become clear later on in the video. Now before I delve into the expansions themselves, first I want to talk about the general reception they had as well as when they actually came out. The first of the expansions is called The Dark Below. It was released in December of 2014 to a pretty mixed reception from the mainstream press, and from what I've seen the actual player base seems to think that the Dark Below expansion is outright awful. It doesn't add a lot to the game and it doesn't really change up all that much, so it's generally seen as more of a DLC than a proper expansion pack. This is much the same with the second expansion pack, which is House of Wolves. It released in May of 2015 and was better received than the previous DLC, The Dark Below, but still not particularly well received in the grand scheme of things. Like with The Dark Below, it was generally seen as not really adding all that much to the game and being rather overpriced for the fairly minimal amount of content that it brings to the table. The third expansion, on the other hand, was much better received. It's called The Taken King and was released in September of 2015 and was basically the end of so-called Year One of Destiny. And unlike the previous two expansions, this actually has quite a bit of content in it, including some new subclasses, which makes it more of a proper expansion pack than simply a DLC. This was followed up by the fourth and final expansion pack, Rise of Iron, which was released in September of 2016 and was basically the end of the so-called Year Two of Destiny. This particular expansion was only released for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One as they had pretty much killed off the previous gen versions of Destiny by that point. The PS3 and Xbox 360 versions simply weren't being updated by that point, so you ended up with a situation where people who were playing it on the previous gen either needed to move over to the new system or just kind of live with what they had at that time. And that particular version was actually what I reviewed when I reviewed the base game for Destiny, because I didn't have any of the expansion packs on the Xbox 360 version, I just had the base game, so I only reviewed base game content. And as a result, I got about the closest thing you can get to the original release of Destiny with that particular version. This brings me to something very important to mention about me going over these expansions and DLCs right now. I am looking at them in their current state, which means that they're all mixed together and it's a real pain to deal with. When Taken King was released, they put in a Spark of Light, which allowed you to instantly raise your character's level up to 25, and then when they put out Rise of Iron, they gave you a Spark of Light that instantly increases your character's level to 40. As a result, I now have three characters that I messed around with in this particular version. I have a Titan, who I started from the ground up. I have a Warlock, which I bumped up to rank 40, because I had actually played that in the original Destiny review anyway. And then I had a Hunter that I put up to 25 to begin with, and then went from there. If you use the Sparks of Light, it automatically unlocks all of the content that you would have normally experienced up to that point. This means that the game effectively thinks that you have already finished the main campaign, as well as, in the case of the Spark of Light for level 25, the House of Wolves and Dark Below expansions, and then in the case of the level 40 Spark of Light, it thinks that you've completed all of the content going up to the Taken King. Now, despite those missions unlocking and the game effectively thinking that you've already finished them, it does not automatically unlock the sort of achievements in the Book of Triumph. This was something they introduced in March of this year when they put in the Age of Triumph update, which was basically the transition year between the original Destiny and Destiny 2. Now, it may sound like I'm rambling at this point, but I really do need to make it very clear to you. If you jump into Destiny, the original Destiny, I mean, right now, it is a complete mess. A new player is going to have absolutely no idea what the hell they're doing. 
And even someone like me, who has played the original Destiny, is going to be extremely confused, because now they have all these options opening up for them, and absolutely no explanation whatsoever. The short version is that regardless of the actual content of the expansions, this is an extremely terrible way to handle introducing the expansions to your game, and especially when you release a compilation of the game with all of the expansions called Destiny the Collection, and then decide, you know what, we're not going to explain anything to new players at all. Now I guarantee you, there's already Destiny fans out there who are taking to the comments and saying how I can't review this now because Destiny 2's out and there's no new updates coming in, there's no Iron Banner anymore, etc, etc. Those same people are probably also taking to the comments to complain about how much I supposedly suck at the game because I'm not using insert weapon here, or insert subclass here, or my light level's not such and such, or I don't have insert optimization for build here, or whatever the hell you want to say about it. Fact of the matter is, I really don't care what the Destiny fans have to say in this regard. I care what the game itself has to say. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and tear right into all four of these expansion packs, starting with the very first one and working our way up from there. As I mentioned before, the first expansion pack is called The Dark Below, and it's actually the tone setter for all of the expansion packs to come. I'll explain more about that in a moment, but first let's talk about the actual story behind The Dark Below. It introduces a new vendor called Eris Morn, and you find out that she was a member of a fire team that went to the moon to try to retake it from the hive, and they failed. She was the sole survivor, and she only managed to survive by hiding out among the tunnels that are scattered all around the moon, and she, in the process, actually ended up losing her light. Somehow she managed to escape from the moon, however, and ended up coming back to the last city in order to warn everyone of the impending return of Crota, a hive prince who is effectively worshipped as a god among the hive. And it's actually kind of amusing, because for something where they make such a humongous deal out of this, where on numerous occasions they act like Crota returning would mean the end of all life as we know it, and yet, not only was this a relatively low-level quest line for something that should be earth-shattering like that, but it consists of three missions. Four if you count the one that was put into the weekly playlist, which is something they introduced during the Age of Triumph update earlier this year. That's also not including the raid that they put in the game, which is in-game content that honestly I did not bother with because I don't care about raids. They take way too long and the results are never optimal. And by take too long, I mean raids can take upwards of several hours to complete. I can barely stand playing Destiny for a period of longer than half an hour, let alone several hours. Not to mention, it requires several uninterrupted hours, and that's something that I never can really manage. I'm constantly getting interrupted by other things. What I do have time to complete, though, are the two strikes that they put into the Dark Below, one of which is just unlocked at the end of the story missions, and the other of which was end-game content for the time it was released, which meant that you had to be level 20 to do it. But even if you include everything that is put into the Dark Below expansion, you still only end up with four story missions, two strikes, and a raid. That's really not a lot of content, considering that the story missions are over in basically an hour, and the strikes themselves only take maybe 20 to 30 minutes apiece. But to make matters worse, the story doesn't really have a lasting impact on the game until they release the Taken King expansion, which is basically an expansion to an expansion, if that makes any sense. But don't worry, we'll get there eventually. As for the Dark Below, however, it adds almost nothing to the game. It adds only three missions, and what story content you actually get there is vague at best. The strikes don't really have a lot of story content in them either, and what you end up with is a really huge missed opportunity. They could have used this to expand upon the Hive and make them more than the nebulous bad guys who look all weird and organic and worship the darkness. All it really does is re-emphasize the fact that they're basically undead, and much like the story in the base game, it just throws a bunch of vague nonsense around and expects you to just kind of go along with it. But by far the most annoying thing about The Dark Below is the fact that they recycle content up the wazoo. All of the story missions take place in the same locations that you've already explored during the story of the base game, so you're just going back and doing the same thing over again. Sometimes they try to put a bit of a twist on it, for example, they'll have you go through a bit of a different section of an area that you've already explored, but you're still going through the same locations over again, and it just feels tedious. It's almost like the content was unfinished, and they didn't go back to finish it until much later on when they made the Taken King, which I will explain in a moment. 
But beyond adding a handful of missions that just rehash things you've already done in the base game, there's not really anything this expansion does. It does increase the light level cap to 32, but that's not that big of a deal in the wake of the Taken King anyway. As a result, the Dark Below ends up easily being the worst of the four expansion packs, and it's not really worth bothering with, even if you do have the complete collection like I do. Now that we've gone over the Dark Below, the next order of business is to take a look at House of Wolves, which is the second of the expansion packs, and unlike the Dark Below, it actually does add a few things to the game that are a bit different. Unlike the 3 plus 1 that Dark Below added, this one actually adds 6 story missions to the game, although one of them is for some baffling reason not accessible anymore because they decided to remove the bounty that you had to take in order to get the quest. I'm really not sure why they did that, but they decided to do that. Anyway, aside from the 6 story missions, or 5 now I guess, they added in an additional strike and they added in a new mode entirely called the Arena Mode, which in their particular case is the Prison of Elders. But I'll talk about that more in a moment. Let's first talk about the actual story of House of Wolves. The idea is that there is a fallen house called the House of Wolves. It previously served the Queen of the Awoken, but now has defected and is under the leadership of a fallen captain named Skolas. He's trying to unite all of the Houses of the Fallen under one banner to become a Kell of Kells, as he refers to himself, and you basically go in to stop him from doing that. Now you may think that this would be a great opportunity to expand upon the culture and the history of the Fallen, except they don't really do that. Oh, don't get me wrong, you do get snippets of it here and there, but much like the Dark Below, what you get is really not much more than reiterating what you already saw throughout the main campaign of Destiny. And what new information you actually get is pretty much just discarded in this expansion because it comes up and then it's never referenced again. And to make matters worse, the whole story about Skolas' defection really doesn't go anywhere. You get through the final story mission and the game basically goes, okay, you're done, now go have fun in the arena. And unlike with the Dark Below, it doesn't really set anything up for future expansion packs. It's all self-contained. I suppose it's entirely possible that they'll do something with it for Destiny 2, but I very highly doubt that. As a result, much like the base game and the Dark Below before it, the story content in House of Wolves is just plain wimpy. Now that said, it is a more substantial DLC than the Dark Below was. Instead of just adding those handful of missions and that was pretty much it, they also add in the Prison of Elders mode, which is an arena mode, where you fight off hordes upon hordes of enemies and you complete various objectives. That said, it is pretty much the same thing as a strike, except instead of it having a semi-story element going along with it, it's just an arena. You complete five rounds, each round has three waves, and all of those are completely randomized, and then at the very end of it all, you have a random mini-boss you have to fight. If your entire team is eliminated or you aren't able to complete all of the objectives within the specified time limit, then you have to restart that round. But if you manage to make it to the end and survive the final boss, then you are given access to the treasure room where you get several chests worth of loot. I wouldn't say it's a mode that's particularly great, but if the arena style gameplay and the extreme repetition of it is your kind of thing, then you'll probably be able to get something out of it. But beyond simply putting in a new mode and a few new story missions, they actually introduced a couple of features to the equipment system, which are the Reforge and Ascension options. Now when the expansion was released, Reforging let you mess around with the actual perks on the various weapons, so you could swap the perks in and out, and Ascension basically pushed the weapon beyond what it was normally capable of to the maximum damage output possible. Except I don't think I can talk about them because as far as I can tell they've actually been removed from the game entirely. Reforging let you actually swap out the perks on your weapons and Ascending brought the weapons up to the maximum damage output possible at that time. And while I can definitely confirm that Reforging has been removed from the game entirely, I'm not sure if Ascension is in the game or not, because even if it is in the game still, then I've actually never used it and I've never had a reason to use it. So about all I can say about them at this point is that they were in the game at one point and now they're not. And this is actually a good way to segue into The Taken King, because House of Wolves is more like The Dark Below. It's a straight up DLC and frankly the asking price for it was kind of ridiculous. For House of Wolves and the Dark Below, they charge $20 a piece for them. And especially in the case of the Dark Below, that is just insane. And even the expansion pass price of $35 was just downright absurd for these things. There just isn't enough substantial content in there to justify the asking price, whether you're talking about the expansion pass price or the individual price especially. 
which means that these disappointingly low on content expansion packs end up becoming downright laughable. Which of course brings me to the next expansion pack, which is the Taken King. Now Bungie was hyping this up to be a pretty major expansion pack, and it came with the major expansion pack price to boot. It was $40. So of course the question there becomes, what does it do to deserve that price hike? Well the first thing you notice is that it has 8 story missions in it, and an actual campaign. Wait a minute, an actual storyline in Destiny? Is this real life? Well, it turns out it is. The story in this one is basically a continuation of The Dark Below. You took out Crota in that particular game, and it turns out that he wasn't the big bad Hive Master. No, that would be his father, Oryx the Taken King. The Hive worship this guy as a god, and when he shows up you know things are about to get serious, because the Awoken fleet goes after him and they are completely curb stomped. See, Oryx shows up with this massive dreadnought that has an extremely powerful, basically doomsday weapon capable of wiping out entire fleets with a single shot. Then Oryx sets about attacking Phobos, one of the moons of Mars, which is a Cabal stronghold, and you find out very quickly what he is capable of doing, which is basically consuming various creatures and turning them towards his bidding. This creates what is referred to as the Taken Army, which is basically just reskinned versions of the various other enemies that you've been fighting, but a few of them have some slight tweaks. For example, they might have a dash move, or they might actually be able to duplicate themselves. So at least there's a bit more enemy variety in the Taken King compared to House of Wolves in the Dark Below, which straight up reused content from the base game and nothing else. But it's not really enough variety to make the expansion feel radically different from the rest of the game, so that is a bit disappointing. Let's face it, we were all pretty much hoping for a large-scale expansion to introduce several new enemies, maybe a whole new enemy faction, something along those lines, and what it does here is it just rehashes things from the previous game as well as the previous two expansions. Slight tweaks or no, it's still rehashing things. But anyway, back to the story for a moment. Oryx shows up and he's there to pretty much wreck everything because how dare you kill his son. So, you have to find a way to bring him down, which means that you have to establish a beachhead, so to speak, on his dreadnought, and then from there you have to track down Oryx and take him down. This is easier said than done, because he's actually hidden behind a dimensional portal, because of course there's dimensional travel in this expansion, right? But anyway, something interesting and ominous is said when you are introduced to that portal, because Eris Morn, the character who's introduced in the Dark Below expansion, says, to get through that portal, you need to become Ascendant, which basically means you need to become a Hive Prince. Now that seems like that would be an awesome twist. You have to become Ascendant, maybe you lose your light in the process and have to get it back somehow, or something along those lines. No, no, that's not how they do it. Instead, you have to go through a crappy stealth segment in order to get the Soul of Crota, and then you use that to get through the portal. Anyway, once you're through the portal, you track down Oryx and you fight him in a boss fight, and once you beat him, the expansion is basically over. Because once you finish the story missions, you are left with four strikes and a raid. And much like the previous expansions in the base game, I didn't really bother with the raid because I don't really have time for that sort of thing. But from what I understand, it's a rather extensive raid. And as far as the strikes go, they're much the same as any other strike that you would be playing in any other expansion or the base game. But just the fact that the expansion contains a story that has a beginning, middle, and end is actually surprising because Destiny doesn't really have that. Thus, you actually get more story in the Taken King than you do in the base game. It's very strange. But the expansion's not done there. In addition to the story missions, the strikes, and the raid, the expansion also features a new subclass for each character type, and you have to go on a quest to get that. Now, in my case, I went as the Warlock to get the Stormcaller, and the quest was a fairly underwhelming experience, because it's basically just a complete pushover. You go in there, you get your subclass, and then you're given infinite super meter to just annihilate everything. It gives you a bit of a power fantasy, and I guess it is nice that you have to go on a quest to achieve a subclass instead of just it being given to you from the start, but at the same time, it is an underwhelming quest and they could have done it better. It could have been something you actually have to work for instead of just going to a location, wiping out every ridiculously easy enemy in the path, and then just going from there. Now to be fair, I went into that with a Warlock at level 40. I imagine it would be a bit more challenging if you were closer to the actual level of the quest, but even then, it's still kind of a pushover. But then there was one very large change that Taken King brought to the table and kind of infuriated a lot of fans of this game, which is that it got a complete rebalance and 20 additional character levels. 
Your max light level as of House of Wolves was 34, and your max level just as a character was 20. Once you hit the Taken King, suddenly your max level as a character is level 40, and your max light level is now 310. They introduced a large swath of new gear, and they completely rebalanced the gear that came before, which meant that you basically had to grind and grind and grind in order to get anything remotely resembling decent gear. Now, if you jump into the game as of the Taken King, that's not really a problem because all of the gear you're going to be getting is balanced around this new system. But if you were already a fan of the game and you already had it before that expansion dropped, then suddenly you would find your gear was completely useless. And as far as I'm concerned, it is completely understandable that people were furious with Bungie for this. And to this day, you will still see people who are really bitter about that big change to Destiny as of the Taken King. Now I have to admit that even on the Xbox 360 version, I was playing the new balancing system because they had dropped the Taken King, it completely revamped all of the levels for everything, and I never really knew what the level system was like before the Taken King dropped. Hence me saying in my review of that 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 was about the closest I could get to the original base Destiny. You can't play the original Destiny anymore because it doesn't exist. That's kind of the danger of it being an online-only game. They can implement whatever changes they want at any time, and it can completely break or salvage the game, and you wouldn't know it if you were going into it after those changes were made. It's both a blessing and a curse, and I really can't tell you how it actually factored in for Destiny, because that's all I've known as I've played it. Perhaps some longtime Destiny fans can explain how they feel about it and what actual changes were made in the comments, because unfortunately I can't. Now that said, as far as the raw content of the expansion goes, and as far as the scope of what changes were made goes, The Taken King is actually the best expansion that was released for the original Destiny. Is it worth $40 though? No. At most, I'd honestly say it's worth maybe 25 or 30 bucks. And that's me being generous, considering that a lot of the content used in this is basically recycled with a different skin on it. But of course, Bungie wasn't really done with the Taken King. They had one more expansion pack in store for us, which was Rise of Iron. This was also a high-priced expansion pack, all things considered. It was $30, and it introduces a new storyline centering around the Iron Lords, which were the predecessors of the Guardians. You may think, sweet, we're gonna see some more backstory, we're gonna learn more about the history of the world of Destiny. No, no, you're not. You're gonna get a glimpse of backstory, which is that, oh hey, the Iron Lords all sacrificed themselves, except for one who was out of the way at the time, in order to contain this technology called SIVA, which is basically self-replicating nanotechnology that just consumes anything it gets in contact with. That's really the only backstory you get about the Iron Lords, it's just that they were the Guardians before the Guardians were a thing, so they're the hipster Guardians, basically. And you end up having to become a new Iron Lord in order to contain SIVA as it comes back when the Fallen unearth it. Much like the previous expansions and much like the base game, they could have gone so far with the story here, except they chose not to. Again, I'm reminded of the speaker. I could tell you, and then there's the implied, but I won't. Or my personal favorite, I don't have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. Seriously folks, the writing in the original Destiny as well as its expansions is just awful in that regard. But regardless, you get five story missions and you complete it in maybe an hour. At least that's about how long it took me to complete the storyline. They also introduced three new strikes and a raid. Because you gotta have one of those for everything, so obviously, like in the other cases, I did not play the raid, I can't really speak for it. Now that said, the Rise of Iron content is really not all that great. It doesn't do all that much to change things. All it does is really increase the light level cap up to about 400, and it introduces a new social hub called the Iron Temple, as well as a series of things for the Crucible. And going purely off of the amount of content here, there's no way in hell it's worth 30 bucks. It's worth no more than the Dark Below or House of Wolves expansions, and even those were overpriced. Add to that the bonus factor of between The Taken King and The Rise of Iron, the PS4 and Xbox One versions actually separated from progression from the PS3 and Xbox 360 versions, because Rise of Iron was never made available on the previous gen consoles, only on PS4 and Xbox One. This means that not only did you have progression that stayed consistent throughout both consoles, so you could actually take your character from the Xbox 360 version and bring it to Xbox One, and the PS3 to bring it to PS4, for example. Now you can't do that. Instead, you have to set up a whole new character on the PS4 or Xbox One versions if you want to play Rise of Iron. 
This was basically the death knell for the previous gen console versions, and this was the final expansion pack that they released for Destiny. They also introduced the Age of Triumph update, but I'm not gonna talk about that really. Because all of that is just in-game content that was made for the transitionary period between the Rise of Iron expansion and the release of Destiny 2. Now all that said, the Rise of Iron expansion is still better than House of Wolves and Dark Below, but that's not really saying much. Both of those were really minimal on the amount of content, and while this one is still minimal, at least it actually has a storyline with cutscenes. That's more than I can say for the Dark Below and House of Wolves. Thus, you rank them in order of best to worst, you end up with the Taken King, Rise of Iron, House of Wolves, and the Dark Below. But the sad thing is, of those expansions, the only one that's really worth having as far as I'm concerned is the Taken King. Rise of Iron may have its own mini storyline, but it's just that, a mini storyline, and the amount of content it has on offer is fairly minimal. Now you may be going, but DW, what about the Crucible maps? Because all of the expansion packs came with Crucible maps and you didn't even mention those. You're right, because I don't care about the Crucible. Because nobody cares about the Crucible. All of the real endgame content in Destiny and all of the real content in general is PvE. It's you with your buddies playing against the game. It's not you playing against other players, especially considering that the game runs on peer-to-peer -peer and it is painfully easy for people to set up lag switches and other things like that. And unfortunately, it seems that Bungie did not learn their lesson from the original Destiny when it comes to Destiny 2 because now the same thing is happening. But anyway, if you want my assessment of the Crucible maps, again, I don't care, but if you are into the Crucible for whatever baffling reason, considering how bare-bones that multiplayer is and how, frankly, unbalanced that multiplayer can get, well then, there's more maps for you to mess around with. Enjoy them. But if you want a general assessment of all of the expansion packs, I have to say that they are some of the weakest expansion packs I have played in quite a while. Three of them barely even add anything to the game, and the one expansion that does actually add content doesn't really add all that much meaningful content. Sure, Rise of Iron and Taken King give you actual storylines that have full cutscenes and everything, but those storylines don't really go anywhere. There's never anything that really comes of the Rise of Iron storyline, and the Taken King expansion is all self-contained. Once you beat Oryx, there's still Taken soldiers that pop up all over the place no matter what you do. And you'd think, for him being basically a world-ending entity, that there would be more consequences to taking him down, but apparently not. Destiny suffers from a general sense of trying to hype things up to be these massive problems that the Guardian must solve or humanity is doomed, and then you solve them and it's really underwhelming when you do, and on top of that, after you've finished those storylines and beaten those ancient evils that have come back to completely destroy humanity, it's like they never even happened to begin with. It is extremely disappointing, and as a whole, I have to say that the expansion packs are just not worth it unless you are an absolute die-hard Destiny fan, in which case I have to question your sanity. Because the entire game is a monotonous grind when you get down to it. It barely has any story to it at all, and what little story it does have is extremely underwhelming. The end game basically consists of grinding for better gear, and when you finally hit max light level, there's basically nothing for you to do. I mean, you could hop into Crucible, but that's a very weak multiplayer experience. You could go on raids, which take hours upon hours and net you almost no loot at all, or you could just replay the content that you've already played through. And the sad part is that when you get down to it, that content that you've been grinding is just not that good to begin with. Depending on who you ask, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I guess you could say I'm insane for trying out the expansions in this and expecting them to actually do something a bit different with the game, but honestly I think that's a pretty reasonable expectation for the expansions to add new different content to expand upon what was already in the game and make things fresh and exciting. And these expansions don't do that. It's just more of what you were already doing in the game with higher numbers attached to it. And frankly, that's just boring. I hope you understand by this point why this is an MTO rather than a review. I can work with a game that pisses me off, but Destiny doesn't do that. It just bores me. And I have no real desire to play any of the raids, I have no desire to play the Crucible, and thus, for those particular segments of the expansions, I really can't speak for them because I have no interest in messing around with them at this point. So I did the next best thing, I completed as much of the PvE content as I felt I could, which was the story missions and the strikes. And since that's the meat of the expansions to begin with, as far as I'm concerned, that's enough for me to at least give some degree of an assessment on them. 
and I wanted to get through the story content of Destiny Plus's expansions before I got to Destiny 2 in order to see if any of the stuff you do in the expansions has any impact on Destiny 2. And from what little I have played of Destiny 2 thus far, I have to say that the expansions don't seem to have had much of an effect. But we'll see. I have quite a bit to go through in Destiny 2 before I finish the game, so I'm not sure if it'll be the next review or not. It most likely will not be. But now that I have this video up, I can go ahead and delve right into Destiny 2, and it should be one of the next few reviews. So stay tuned for that if you're interested, but as far as the expansions for Destiny go, I simply cannot recommend them. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you all in later videos.